Good evening, Mr. Bond fans, and welcome once again to what is my review of the final Ian Fleming James Bond novel. We're still going to have one more book to look at after this one with the uh, Bond stories written by Fleming, but The Man with the Golden Gun represents the final Bond adventure that Fleming completed before he died. So this is really where his continuity for his version of Bond ends. So a disclaimer about the work up front, uh, Fleming was very, very ill when he was writing this particular book and he died before he was able to complete anything beyond just kind of like a first full draft. So what we're talking about here is certainly not a completed work, and by its very design, it is going to be inherently flawed. The original author was not able to fully achieve his vision for it, given the circumstances going on around him. So, with all that in mind, the main thing I'm going to be looking at today is just, well, I mean, is the book any good? Well, let's talk about the plot and find out. So if you recall, the last Bond adventure ended on something of a cliffhanger, with Bond brainwashed into believing he was a Japanese fisherman, and he got his girlfriend Kissy pregnant, and then he left her to go to Russia to learn more about his past, because he had some kind of like inkling at the back of his mind that told him he needed to go there, and not since From Russia With Love has a Bond story ended on quite such a dramatic cliffhanger. And I was super interested to see how Bond would come back from this, and I kind of thought we were going to start in Russia and maybe follow Bond around there, kind of understand what he'd been getting up to there um, since the end of the previous book, but no, it turns out Bond has been further brainwashed by the Russians, no less, and has been sent back to London to assassinate his former boss, M. So this is quite a shocking development uh, in concept. I mean, I was braced for this particular development. Someone had commented on um, one of my previous book reviews and just sort of, you know, said, oh, it gets real crazy when Bond tries to assassinate M. So I was kind of braced for this. Um, but it's still, nonetheless, quite shocking and such an odd thing to happen, an odd development. It's very exciting and Bond is like clearly like dead behind the eyes in these opening few pages. He's just like completely not the man he was. He's almost like a shell pretty much and um, he's acting very robotically and everyone around him is kind of aware of this but putting him through all the necessary stages to reach M all the same because people are giving him the benefit of the doubt I guess and M is allowing the the process to continue and then of course Bond gets sat down in front of M and he pulls out a pistol which is full of cyanide and shoots at M who presses a button and then some protective screen thing comes down from the ceiling and Bond is apprehended. So I would have thought that this whole development would have been enough for like an entire story in itself. I mean, Bond is brainwashed by Russians. I mean, that's like as pretty big a deal as it can get almost. And you know, what happened in detail? And why, you know, what does he recall of this experience? Like, I, there's so much exploration potential to that idea. So it's a bit of a shame that we're not really gonna talk all that much about it in this story. So immediately after the assassination, Bond is like captured and bundled off and everyone's like, Em, are you alright mate? And he's like, what? Yes, no, 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 I'm totally fine. Yes, yes, yes. Well, well, should we have Bond arrested? No, 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 don't be ridiculous. No, let's just give him a, give him a good mission, snap him out of it. Where's that Scaramanga case file? Everything here happens so quickly, and this isn't a big book by any stretch of the imagination, and I would have liked to have a bit more detail in these early chapters, because after so many stories and the Bond-M relationship, I mean, for Bond to try to kill M is just, I mean, this is a massive deal, so it's disappointing that the rest of the story does become a somewhat standard Bond-Fleming adventure. I mean, for me, it's especially disappointing. I've said time and time again in these videos how the Bond-M scenes are some of my favourite passages in all of the books, which is saying something to say that two guys basically chatting over a desk is, like, some of the most riveting stuff in the book, but it, it, it is, and so for that, because I know that this is the end, so for this to be the end of that is somewhat disappointing. But of course the author did die so it feels a little bit sort of nitpicky of me to even be complaining about these things, but here we are. Bond's mission here is very simple. Francisco Scaramanga is a hitman who has killed some allies and MI6 wants rid of him. He's known as the man with the golden gun because he uses a golden revolver and is an expert marksman. He's a very dangerous foe, but Bond is keen to prove his worth now that he has been unbrainwashed. And I guess M uses the mission as an excuse to snap him back into shape. And you know, if that doesn't happen and he dies on the mission, then at least he dies on the job. 
So next time we pick up with Bond, he is not entirely back to normal, but more or less himself, and he's heading to Jamaica to find Scaramanga there and take him out. In Jamaica, he meets up with Mary Goodnight, who has been his personal secretary um, in, in a past, in a couple of the previous books, and I haven't really talked much about her, but she has been a presence. Um, anyway, she's been transferred to the Jamaican station, and Bond has been a bit flirty with her before, but here he's outright, like, telling her to wear a low-cut top and being incredibly flirtatious and she's giving it right back to him and it's like, wow, this relationship escalated quickly. So Bond and Goodnight between them establish a cover for Bond, they use the name Mark Hazard and Bond sets out to find Scaramanga and does so with surprising ease and then the pair have a conversation in a, in a brothel and Scaramanga, on the basis of this one conversation, hires Bond to be his personal secretary. I'm having, like, flashbacks to Goldfinger now where pretty much the exact same thing happened and I'm just like, what is it about James Bond in these books that makes people just, like, you know, barely know him and just be like, yeah, yeah, you're the man for all my administrative tasks. But anyway, Scaramanga is having a business meeting with a bunch of gangsters and unsavory types at a hotel, and I'm not really sure at all what's going on, but um, or what indeed the ultimate plan is, but it seems like they're doing something of everything. I mean, there's money laundering, there's drug dealing, there's prostitution, there's something going on with Russians, but so much of this information we only gather through basically like Bond putting a glass to a, a wall or a door and like listening in on someone else's private meeting. So it's all a little bit just like dumped on you as a reader and there's so much of it. I really don't know what the grand plan is here. Also, Felix Leiter is here, and that was a genuine surprise. I had no idea that he came back at this point. I mean, the last time we saw him, I think, if memory serves, was Thunderball, which was quite a few books back now. Anyway, he's back at the CIA, and the CIA are, like, uh, undercover, working at this hotel where Scaramanga's having his business meeting, because um, they're kind of on to him as well, and by this point, Bond has had more than one opportunity to kill Scaramanga, but it would have been in cold blood, so he decides that he's not going to kill Scaramanga, and I don't think that we get enough detail in those moments. I mean, I like the idea that Bond is kind of, like, broken from everything that happened to him with Kissy and then in Russia, and he's kind of a defective operator here, and I like that, but I... I the fact that he just doesn't think it's very sporting to shoot Scaramanga in the back of his head when he's given the opportunity... It, I, I don't know if that works for me. I mean, the guy is an assassin, for goodness sake, and, you know, he doesn't have to like it, he just has to do it. And we've seen him kill, like, plenty of people in previous adventures, so quite why he's on the moral high ground here, I just put down to him sort of being kind of brainwashed and then unbrainwashed and then unbrainwashed and brainwashed and all this kind of brainwashing has just kind of made him somewhat defective. It gets particularly silly when like Scaramanga and his gangster friends are talking and word has got to them that there is an, a British agent like in Jamaica looking for Scaramanga and they're all like and Bond's just there like hanging out and they're all like huh do you have any anyone know anyone who fits that description and Bond's just like oh no <laughs> Things culminate on a train that Scaramanga is using to take the gangsters to another part of the island, and there's a whole load of stuff that happens here. There's a shootout, and then there's a, a mannequin in a blonde wig tied to the train tracks in front of the train that's supposed to be good night, and Scaramanga's tricking Bond into thinking that it's good night, but whatever. Like, Felix blows up a bridge, and the gangsters are all killed except for Scaramanga, who makes it away, but he's badly wounded, and Bond gives chase, and then we get to what is my genuine, absolute highlight of this book. There's this one chapter that I just absolutely adore, and it involves Bond pursuing Scaramanga through this swamp land, and Scaramanga is very injured, and he finds him kind of just dying, basically, in this swamp, and Bond just, like, observes him for a while, and we see him, like, there's a snake coming towards him, and Scaramanga kills the snake, and then he starts eating the snake, and then he spots Bond, and they just, like, start having a conversation. Up until this point, the book has been very light in the kind of detail that we're used to with 
Fleming's works. The whole thing just feels very thin, and there isn't much meat on the bones, but this chapter just felt so full of life and intrigue and character and peculiar little Fleming details that I'd been missing through the rest of the story. Anyway, this is nonetheless where we have a showdown between Bond and Scaramanga, and it's a pretty pathetic showdown by design, and I like that a lot. This really isn't a Pistols at Dawn sort of affair. Scaramanga is pretty much dying anyway, and he's slumped on the ground, and Bond is standing over him, and still being somewhat reluctant to kill the man in cold blood, and Scaramanga asks, for a little bit of time for him to make peace with God, uh, which has not been a theme at all. There's been not much mention of religion so far, but okay, whatever. Bond allows it, and then Scaramanga whips out his gun and shoots Bond before Bond fires back and kills Scaramanga. I wish that this moment was more symbolic of Bond being, like, kind of back in the game, as it were, but Bond has been such an an effective agent throughout this whole story. I mean, Felix and the CIA have been doing a better job than he's been doing, and they could probably just have taken care of the whole situation themselves had Bond not gotten himself involved. Anyway, Bond recovers from his shooting in the hospital, and Goodnight visits him, and word arrives that they're going to knight Bond. They're gonna make him Sir James and bestow a load of honours on him, which he rejects because he's not interested in that type of thing, titles and whatnot, and and thus the story ends with Bond taking Goodnight up on an offer to recuperate at her place. It's a curious ending, and it doesn't feel entirely out of character for Bond to reject the honours, and knowing that this is Fleming's final Bond adventure, it feels somewhat fitting to end that way. I like that he's rejecting the kind of honours, and, you know, they don't really mean much to him and all that, but I... Nothing is made of Bond and Kissy's child, and I'm curious to know if Fleming would ever have had any plans to revisit that idea somewhere down the line. I can only assume that he would have done, because otherwise why would you put it in the end of the last book? But obviously, I guess we'll never know. To say that this is the final Bond novel, it's hard to get too excited by the plot as it is. I mean, things here feel more personal to Bond, which I like, and but really, like, all the details of Scaramanga's villainous scheme with the gangsters, none of it really matters. It's really not important. What is important is Bond finding himself and proving himself, but even that feels kind of thin and underdeveloped. For Bond himself up front, I think it's an interesting development to show him susceptible at all to brainwashing. It does disconnect you as a reader from the hero of the story for the first few chapters of the book, and I think that's quite a brave choice. I just wish we got more on it, because I, you know, I, I understand that such a story would have been quite introverted, and maybe we don't want an entire book of Bond being rehabilitated to life in London, fish out of water style, but after everything that happened to him in the last two books, I wouldn't have minded if this was more of a character piece, and we just kind of you know, forewent the grand villain scheme that we always need to have. As it stands, the Bond in this story is certainly more influenced by the film version of Bond, this book obviously being published after the film series was started, but then I generally feel that Bond as a character has been a lot lighter since you know, Doctor No the book was published, which obviously predated the films, um, and I don't know if that if that particular Bond persona really gels with the more characterful, explorative stories that I wanted from this book and the previous one, but, you know, okay, it's fine. So the main supporting character is, of course, Scaramanga, and uh, he's described as being Spanish, but I... Despite that, the way he's written, the way he's described, when I was reading him, I just had this image of, like, Ewell Brenner and Sam Elliott and that kind of voice. And I just imagined him as, like, this kind of old Western movie villain, like, brought to life. And I know that that isn't really what Fleming was going for, but the fact that I could comfortably project my own version of this character onto what I was reading on the page and not have that be jarring says a lot about how little we actually get on Scaramanga, and indeed many details in this book. He doesn't feel like a villainous mastermind at all, not on the level of Blofeld and Goldfinger, for sure, and his aims are so convoluted. He doesn't feel like the kind of villain that we're used to getting, and, you know, I mean, he's a good shot, and that's about it, really. There are a couple of references to Scaramanga being gay, and nothing really is done with this, but I guess that maybe we're supposed to think that this is why he would hire Bond 
to be his personal secretary or bodyguard or whatever it is, because he takes kind of a shine to him and he has a crush on him, maybe? I my, my favorite bit is when M at the start of the story is reading Scaramanga's file and he comes to this one bit about, you know, maybe Scaramanga's gay and the reasoning they use, or part of the reasoning, is that he can't whistle. And I have no idea where Fleming got that particular notion, but it should come as no surprise to you, dear viewer, that gay people can indeed whistle and have been known to whistle a jaunty tune every now and then. I mean, I just don't know where Fleming would get such a thing. I mean, I know that he lived next door to Noel Coward in Jamaica, so maybe just Noel Coward couldn't whistle and Fleming observed this and was like, huh, oh, interesting. On the merry good night in the book, I feel like I've actually got a whole new appreciation for what Britt Eklund did in the film. I mean, Good Night in the Book is smart-ish, I guess we're led to believe, but she really does come across as a bimbo, and she does the whole, like, you know, disapproving of Bond's flirting, but deep down she really wants him. She does all that kind of thing, which is just kind of like standard Fleming woman, and like Scaramanga, she's just so light as a character, there's really nothing much to her. Similar for Felix here as well. He's here, but I don't know if he really needed to be. They don't have much time for banter, and what they do have just feels kind of hollow. And by Thunderball, I just felt like the two had such a great rapport and really felt like good pals. And here it's just like, it really does feel like we're just going through the motions. M is another significant figure in the story, even though he isn't on the page all that much. I mean, we learn his full name, which is interesting. But beyond that, I, I just think it's kind of fascinating that he's so light on Bond after Bond tries to kill him. M would certainly not talk about his emotions, I mean, much less admit to having any emotions at all, but I certainly feel like he does care a lot about Bond from what happens in this story, and I think it is his way of showing, like, forgiveness, praise, I, I don't really know what, but it, 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 it's, he does do a lot for Bond by simply just not reporting to any, you know, higher up authorities about the assassination attempt, and he just kind of, like, gets... Bond sent on this new mission so it can kind of be business as usual, I think, and that, in a way, is kind of the ultimate show of affection from, from M to Bond. And it's especially poignant with this, of course, being the last Fleming penned Bond adventure. So there's really not all that much in common between the book and the film at all. The location completely changes, and as such, so does a lot of the plot elements that are linked in with the location. So there's, you know, no Solex agitator to be found in this book. Scaramanga and his backstory is transferred over, being raised in a circus and having a connection with an elephant and such, and the casting of Christopher Lee makes the biggest of differences, though, and the villain of the film is much more debonair, as they were trying to make him kind of like a, uh, a, a dark side of the film version of Bond. Good Night is actually very accurately represented in the film from the book, and when I was reading the book, I really couldn't think of anyone else except for Britt Eklund in the part when I was reading those scenes. So yeah, there's the villain and the girl, but the rest is so different. Like Moonraker, Diamonds Are Forever, and The Spy Who Loved Me, this is one of the novel-to-film translations that took the least amount possible from the source material. Overall, The Man with the Golden Gun is just such an odd one, and it feels so unfair to be critical about it at all. I mean, it is an incomplete work, written by a severely ill man who reportedly didn't even like it very much when he handed in his first draft, so... <laughs> With all those credentials, it's hardly going to be one of the best, is it? But there is stuff to enjoy, and I like the first couple of chapters, and there's some good... Bond Scaramanga interactions, and I absolutely adore that chapter in the swamp with the snake, like, all oh, that's fantastic, but this should only really be required reading for those who are determined to seek out every single Fleming Bond story, you know, for completists, basically. This is certainly not one that would appear in many people's top Bond book lists, I don't think. But we do still have one Fleming Bond book left to discuss, so there is still a chance that this review series might end on something of a positive. Ian Fleming may have passed away, but that certainly didn't stop further publications of uh, another collection of short stories featuring James Bond, known as Octopussy and The Living Daylights, which we'll be discussing next time before ranking all of the Fleming books in order from worst to best as judged by me.
So that's it for this time, Bond fans. As always, please do leave me comments with your take on this review and of the book itself um, in the comments section below. I think we've had some good discussions going over this sort of book review series. And uh, yeah, I'm, I keep getting asked if I'm going to be reviewing like the Bond continuation novels after I'm done with Fleming, and that is the case. Yes, I already am away into Colonel Sun, actually. So I'm, you know, that review will be coming once we're done with all the Fleming ones and the rankings done and everything. Thing. Otherwise, please do head over to my Facebook and Twitter pages, uh, head over to my Patreon page if you care to do so, and until next time, Bond fans, so long for now.